Um, Lennox Thomas is a, a former uh, clinical social worker, a probation officer with children and families, who now works in intercultural psychotherapy and working with refugee communities and, and trauma. He's a trained psychoanalytic psychotherapist um, with children and family, as well as a, a, a family psychotherapist. Um, he was a former director of, um, of cult, intercultural psycho, uh, psychoanalytic and psychotherapy at UCL, and is currently the vice chair of the Refugee Ther Therapy Centre. And uh, okay, now this paper is called Empires of Mind, and it was written as a result of one of the experiences I had of having a, a patient in therapy, who is in fact mentioned in one of the case. Uh, one of the brief case histories early, later on. The patient was called Gita, and she was talking about her workplace. Gita uh, was a British-born Asian woman, and how she felt that one of her colleagues treated her like an ayah, an Indian nanny during the Raj. And as she was born here, I was fascinated. How does well, well, she know about this? This precedes her by about 50 or 60 years. But anyway, I was very curious about what it meant and the intent of her and her colleague. And it led me to thinking about what it actually means, the, the effect of colonialization and psychotherapy, because I'm a colonized person and she's kind of a colonized person, although she's a British born and, and Asian, um, and what it actually means. Okay. <clears throat> So living in a post-colonial culture, many people have a connection with empire. This might be descendants of former subjects of far-off lands, the pink portions on the old world map, or as the offspring of those who went out to those countries to run them. Those days are collectively looked back on as a golden age by traditional British society. I'm interested in this pride in time that have gone by and how it affects us as therapists. How do stories of empire leave its mark on us all? What do we make of the images in colonial literature, for example in Paul Scott's Raj trilogy, or in Foster's A Passage to India, and more recently in Andrea Levy's A Small Island, the story of a Jamaican immigrant to this country? How are we as therapists affected in the consulting room? And in what ways might the therapy be influenced on the intense pressure of the transference? And the transference, of course, is the, the layers of relationship between the psychotherapist or the psychoanalyst and their patient. The tra traditional nature of British society and the pride of a once governing part, large parts of the globe has contributed to the formerly colonized being viewed through a particular lens by the colonizer. Colonialization was an economic enterprise to gain wealth from far off countries. In some cases, they were not that far off. The colonialization of Ireland has left its wounds that are still not healed. The potato famine and its consequences are just below the surface of some older Irish people. And the sectarian violence is still in our recent past. The effect that this has had on the mind of the colonizing nation is that of seeing the colonized as somehow less than, making it possible for signs to be displayed in lodging houses in London, barring entry to the Irish, black and Asian people, and also to dogs. The legislation in the 1960s, this legislation in the 1960s wasn't actually repelled until 1968. The lasting psychological effect has been that the colonized mind that was left in its wake and the accommodation of the notion of inferiority in the colonized and, of course, the notion of superiority in the colonizer. India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, had already been settled by, in the south by Portuguese traders and by Persian Mughals in the north. The British also moved there as traders with the East India Company then later with an army, government, the church, and the railway. In the case of India, there was already an existence of a complex caste system and a mixture of religious beliefs. There were well-developed systems of government organized by Mughal rulers and feudal princes. 
before the arrival of the British, East Africans had contact with Muslim travelers and the culture of the Arab world just over the water, centuries before the arrival of the Europeans. Abyssinia had three Abrahamic religions, Islam, Judaism, and Orthodox Christianity, probably long before it actually got to the West, as Hodder and I was discussing. Yeah. Christianity got to Africa before it got to England. Reminds me of that, that uh, interesting interview that, that uh, Mahatma Gandhi had with a journalist when he came to this country in 1936, I think. And the, the journalist said to him, what do you think of British civilization, Mr. Gandhi? He said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> the West African nation of Mali had great, a great mosque at Jingueba by the 14th century, the kingdom of the Ashanti in Ghana and in Benin, and in Kano of northern Nigeria were well-developed systems of government. The famous bronzes of Benin had been produced by the 13th century, and the Christian Orthodox Church in Lalibela in Ethiopia had been hewn out of solid rock by the 12th century. Against this background came the capturing of Africans for later enslavement in the Caribbean and the Americans in the mid-16th century. The trade in Africans was a long-established practice by Arabs centuries earlier. The making of money was the European objective because there were fortunes to be made in the so-called New World. <coughs> Nothing was more efficient than slavery for wealth creation, and this continued for the following 300 years. Plantations in the Caribbean and America became engines for the production of wealth <coughs> in the form of sugar, tobacco, coffee, spices, and cocoa. Colonizing and exploiting native labor was big business conducted by most European nations in Africa, China, and the Caribbean, India, and the Americas. And this is a quote from someone in the 16th century, a Reverend Catcott, quoted in David Davidine's book. The quote, in a word, the whole earth is the market, the whole earth is the market of Britain. And while we remain at home safe and undisturbed, have all the products and commodities of the Eastern and Western Indies brought to us in our ships and delivered into our hands. Meeting the colonizers on their own ground. Um, there were not many people of the colonies traveling as free men and women in the UK before the beginning of the 20th century. Caribbean and Indian elites sent their children to be educated here as they still do. It was not until coming here during the two world wars as volunteers from the Caribbean that they encountered worrying degrees of prejudice and discrimination. The men and women who had served in the forces and the factories in the UK found that on coming over to assist with the reconstruction of Britain, the mother country in the late 40s, that they were as excluded as other Indians and West Indians who had not served. Now, they made this distinction that having served and, and, and actually avouched their lives for the country, that they would expect a different treatment from any ordinary West Indian, but they were all niggers to the English. So, <clears throat> and a whole discontentment began with that, with that. They were colonial people who were beginning to fall out of love with the mother country, because they had found themselves unwanted. And there's a lovely kind of description of this in Samuel Selvon's novel, The Lonely Londoners. Indians and Anglo-Indians who had given good service to the Raj, often turning their backs on Indian nationalism, had seen themselves on independence as coming home to England. Many were disillusioned. Immigrants from the former colonies had to adjust to be seen as foreigners in the UK. It is unlikely that the English felt like foreigners in India or Africa, because it was, after all, part of their empire. So it's a whole different kind of status that we were awarded. Thinking that we were part of this huge empire family, we were just foreigners. And coming here, I came here as a six-year-old to this country, and a lot of, I mean, even my teachers didn't know where the West Indies were. 
I was, I was upset. I was shocked. The children thought I was Korean. I was a refugee from the war in Korea, which had just gone by. And teachers didn't know where the, where the West Indies were. And one actually said, oh, you speak English very well for a foreigner. In fact, I spoke English better than he did. <laughs> Extra extraordinary. And this also, but as I, I read it later on in the paper, this kind of um, special status that afforded to English and Englishness, is, it falls, the scales fall from your eyes when you come to this country and realize that England is not that special. <laughs> Chap liver, <laughs> just ordinary. <coughs> so learning from literature, I actually find that reading, reading fiction is probably better than reading a lot of books to learn about prejudice and to learn about behavior. Um, <clears throat> I keep taking these glasses off, they're brand new and I haven't got used to them yet, but uh, uh, I can only have them on for reading. So reading literature I find more interesting than reading hard books. And actually as a, as a teacher of psychotherapy I use literature, I use novels because I find them useful and, and I kind of part of the common culture and accessible to people. So it is from a reading of fiction that I found the most interesting learning on personal interactions for my psychotherapy practice. Stereotypes and ethnic set pieces are usually presented to us in a lively, unselfconscious way. So how do stories of empire leave its mark on us all? What do we make of the images in colonial literature, for, exa literature, for example, in Paul Scott's Raj trilogy? I don't know if people know the, the books. No? No, not at all. Whoa. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. There are three books that were written about um, the transition in India from being part of the empire to being independent. So it would be in and about the Second World War. In fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a series on television, on independent television, called Indian Summers. Yeah, I've heard people have watched it, but it's about the same period, where, where it's the end of the Raj and the beginning of the Indians taking, um, taking over their own country. So in the Raj trilogy, Mrs. Bullaboy is a grasping Indian landlady who seeks to extract rent from her increasingly impoverished English tenants in post-Raj India. In, post, in Foster's, now people must have come across a passage to India, yeah? Okay. Thinking, what a what an illiterate bunch of all are. <laughs> <laughs> so in a passage to India, Dr. Aziz has a puppy like love of the British and all things English until his betrayal. After his acquittal on trumped up charges of offences against the newly arrived English woman, Dr. Aziz almost ritualistically removes his Western linen suit the kind of the, the attire of the Saabs, and he puts on the native shalwa kameez. Foster had a keen understanding of the subtle and complex interactions around the issues of both British rule and the effect it had on the colonized. And Dr. Aziz is actually decolonizing himself ritually by putting on the shalwa kameez and removing the linen suit of the Raj. In Andrea Levy's Small Island, Small Island? It's not very old. Some of you might have read it. Hortense, the Jamaican heroine, is humiliated in the offices of Herringay Council when her application to teach is turned down. She's rejected and told that her qualification from the teacher's training college in Jamaica was worthless. She reflected on how this could be because all of her lecturers were English. Now, that is, that is the kind of the essence of the magic, thinking that if they were English and they were teaching uh, education to us in Jamaica, then it must be valid, it must be worth something. Had she gone to another teacher's training college that were just Jamaicans, Hortense would have probably understood. Because they were English, it sort of should have had this extra cachet that validated it as pucker. She reflected on how this could be. These and other acts of betrayal faced the children of empire on their arrival in the mother country. 
and in Bowani Junction by John Masters, which you, will, you guys will never have heard of, tells the story of mixed people of India around the time the country was to be partitioned by the British. Not only do we see the broader political picture, but the lives of an Anglo-Indian railway family and the petty rules and racism restricting the lives of a nation divided by skin colour, privilege and caste. Victoria Jones is an Anglo-Indian. She's the heroine of the piece. She's not quite the real thing. Looks white, but isn't white. And English men were prepared to take liberties with her. She becomes disillusioned with the English, which she had hitherto prized, only to find that trying to become Hindu was not going to be the answer either. I'm going to stop after this bit on literature. Jean Rees, uh, the author of Wide Sargasso, see herself a Creole, decided to write a life for the poor creature, the mad Caribbean woman in the attic of Charlotte Bronte's novel, Jane Eyre. Now, all of you would have read this. It was part of the O-level syllabus. This she did in White Sargasso Sea. Here we see Antoinette Rochester before she becomes the prisoner in Thornfield Hall. Her story is sympathetically told, which contrasts with the portrayal as a mad savage by Charlotte Bronte. One cannot help thinking that she's being used as a literary device a counterpoint to the virginal Victorian Jane Eyre, a model of chastity and decency. Rees, on the other hand, saw Antoinette Rochester as a betrayed and cheated woman whose fortune-hunting English husband no longer had use for her. Forlorn, she descends into madness, a condition that runs in her family. Meetings of the colonised with the colonizer have many interesting results. The recently published The Sugar Barons describes the immense wealth of those who amassed for fortunes through sugar and slave labour, and the fortune hunting that went on in order to, make, to maintain grand English country houses. With their powers, planters and their managers in the Caribbean behave in ways that they couldn't in Britain. No, thank you very much. And I think that also brings us to uh, directly to the issue, perhaps that's kind of floating on the on the on the outside, but I think central to this, which is ostensibly colonialism and, and race mm. and racism, um, and the way in which uh, that's one of the things I wanted to speak to actually that that we we talk about colonialism and British Empire, but there's still sort of an idea that it wasn't a racial project, and that in fact, um, if we think about what does racism do to human beings. Um, we can almost say that it's, it's, a, it's a metaphysical um, uh, sort of exercise in that it 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 makes it, it literally makes a division of humans who was who was human who was not human and the measure of people. So words like half caste, quadroon mm. make sense in our ling language. Mm. That um, and 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 mixed means something. And that the, your 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 ability to have honour, like the 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 example of literally speaking about the Anglo-Indian woman who mm. men take liberties with, um, are uh, sort of subjugated. And then, of course, in my sort of where I come to this, that I, I come from sort of Fanonian perspective, which um, Franz Fanon's wrote, you know, I think uh, as a, as a psych, uh, psychiatrist, so one of the I think the epic. Um, uh, Chronicle of, of colonialism and of what race actually the, the, the meanings of race um, looked at uh, looked at this area. And so um, I don't wanna, I don't want to sort of get into this too much, but um, yeah, I think that there there are many issues that you sort of you, you point to, and I think the, the sort of the, the literature that you you drew examples from, I think, kind of illustrates sort of the, the operations of race. Mm. Um, so I just want I mean we've, we've not I don't I think it's kind of mentioned that. I think we have to think about when we think about the colonial project and British Empire as a racial project that created white people and created black people and all those sort of bodies in between, and how that that empire that that structure is something that makes sense to us today. Um, that's, very, that's very interesting. Yeah. The, the, the colonial project created white people. Yes. Because it was <laughs> because it was on meeting black people and brown people that white people became white people. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> and I think that um, you know, if you could go all the way to sort of I think go into sort of the humanist projects and um, or we look at, you know, 
works as Kant, Hegel, race is actually central to it and, 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 and ellipse all together. So um, this is very, then we can, all the, our favorite existentialist writers, you know, uh, Sarté and, and Fanon sort of talk about these things. And I think uh, existentialism and phenomenology to sort of get to the kind of the hidden operations of what mm. race is. Mm. But I think race is not something that's really understood or mm. we get scared about talking about it. But yeah, um, and that black is the human other. So you cannot be white without black. So we can't think so, for example, you know, that, 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 um, that Hortense could have, an, um, could have a sort of an intelligence that we could be able to teach a uh, Harrogate Council um, goes against what white considers itself to be, which is the educator and the possessor mm. of knowledge. Yeah. How can this blackened body hold that? Even so, um, Fanon says, you know, when, when the black body enters into the room, Lisa leaves. So we can see this kind of violence that, that the colonized body receives and the racialized body, you know, in, in our post-colonial time. Thank you. So with the emancipation from slavery in 1840, the demise of the British Empire after the Second World War and the forming of a Commonwealth, what has become the old roles and relationships of empire? Trade and the acquisition of wealth was the first aim of colonialization. Secondary aims were the propagation of a language and culture of the colonizer. What also came with, this, with the seamless and intricate system of class and color? <coughs> the language of empire has seamlessly, has seemingly old hat, nevertheless conveyed the nature of formal relationships the people of the colonies shared with each other. Who are the new Pankawalas, Memsabs, the Masters, the Creoles, the Quadroons, the Anglo-Indians? Among themselves, the Caribbeans have color codes and status that they've been trying to shake off since the 1950s, which still has little meaning in, in the modern UK. What people in the UK don't realize is that we, we also had a code of class and color in the Caribbean. And it was also the same in India and in most of the colonies. So that arriving here, we all look black, but we all have our own code and code systems, and we all know, we can all identify each other and know who we are. So this is a quote from a really interesting book that everyone should read, called Dead Woman Pitney, by Yvonne Shorter Brown, a Canadian academic, and she the quote in the quote, I wept for the brutal history into which we were born that of a racist slave society in which families sorted their children and kin by their physiognomy. Clear skin, black skin, good hair, bad hair, straight noses, flat noses, and all the tricky combinations of interracial mixing that as such were the accumulation, the ammunition of racist abuse. Over the passage of time, status has changed, but how does this affect the way that we relate to each other now? How are the relationships in therapy in the consulting room, and how do they affect? How are they affected by this history? What effect does this have on self-love and self-esteem? And how indeed do our social relationships affect those that we have in therapy with people who are culturally and ethnically different? as well as those who bear similarities to ourselves. Now this bit I call disorders of empire. All the things that we managed to have got wrong and are yet to put right. Disorders of, as a, of empire are a contextual and relational, <coughs> affecting both colonized and the colonizer. The partitioning of India and the inter-ethnic violence that followed was a disorder of empire as much as the notes that were pinned onto the boarding houses, boarding house doors. <laughs> Disorders are not necessarily gross into the incidents, and are more subtle as time passes. What they reflect are the attitudes <clears throat> that were prevalent and normal at the time for colonizer and colonized. The system operated so that the British would see the other as a lesser person, and the subject native to, be, to obediently agree with this belief, having been trained to do so over hundreds of years. Moreover, the world around them that reflected all of this. 
What black and brown children saw around them gave concern to adults because of the psychological accommodation of this, the distorting effect that this had on their personalities and the sense of their racial identity. The mask that some black and minority ethnic children put on in a society that might be hostile or unfacilitating and threatening to them is termed a proxy self, often a protection against the ridicule of being different or a way of avoiding the need to explain the proxy effects and deflects attention and smooths out differences. Now this is very similar to what Fanon talks about as mask wearing. Fanon wasn't the only person who talked about this. Um, a psychoanalyst called Don Winnicott also talked about um, a false self, false self and false self identities. And here I actually think that both of them have some kind of a relevance in what I have to say. So, the prox proxy mask deflects attention and smooths out the difference. Usable in their relationships with anyone, teacher, school staff, therapist, social worker, the proxy is a move for self-protection. The ubiquity of the proxy selves to protect the real authentic child. Its persistence, use sets up a self-disorder, and as Winnicott suggests, with the false self, left untreated, will ultimately lead to a split in the mind, and at, at its worst, to schizophrenia. True and false self, constructed selves and proxy selves, and their functions are means employed by the child for a psychological survival. From Winnicott's work on the true and false self, the infant, arriving in a family where the primary caregiver is unable to fully meet the emotional needs of the child, the child then adapts to the needs of the parent. For, su for survival, a bifurcation, a splitting occurs, and many black and minority children adopt a pro proxy mask to both project onto the world an acceptable self to the others, as well as to protect a part of themselves that is hidden and precious, and whose needs are not met. This hidden part of the true self, this hidden part is the true self, and the false self is the proxy which is necessary for survival. Integration would be the aim of therapy for those who didn't manage to integrate during the process of maturation, and integration is considered necessary for good mental health. The re repeated pattern of forced family separation during enslavement, which is the other, this is the other huge motif in this piece, is that slavery wasn't just the exploitation of labor, but it was the destruction of the black family, the destruction of relationships, and the separation of children from their parents, and wives from their husbands, and lovers from each other. And this was forced. It was enforced. So after three or four hundred years of this, how does it leave, leave people in terms of their capacity to form relationships, and what value they place on attachment and relationships, which is a very important part of the human existence. So the repeated patterns of forced family separation during enslavement still affects people of the Caribbean and the Americans, who frequently parted from their children and fathers separated from their families. You know, we talk about what is it with this one parent thing among black families? Slavery is what it's about. That's what it is. It's a pattern that was set up where they weren't allowed to have relationships. They didn't even live in the same homes. Men lived in a set of quarters for themselves, women in the other. It was only after the 1840s that black men and women in the Caribbean and the Americas actually were able to live together as couples. It wasn't allowed. So we're still working our way backwards after 300 years of one way of it being like that. So, 74 years after the abolition of slavery in the United States of America during the Jim Crow days, that's what they called American apartheid, in 1939 an African-American couple were commissioned to do some research in schools, 
And this was amazing because they were black psychologists, they were developmental psychologists. Kenneth and Mamie Clark devised research around identity and attitudes among young school children. In a white school, the children were presented with a group of dolls. Some people must know this study. It's a very famous study, the doll studies. Have some people come across the doll studies? No? I'll read slowly. Because it's seminal. You have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course you have. You're black, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. In a white school, the children were presented with a group of dolls, a basket of dolls, arranged from dark chocolate to white. One by one, the children were each asked to choose a doll from the collection which they felt they could trust, would not be mean, who could be a friend to them. And when all the children had completed the experiment, they had chosen the white dolls, which is, you know, you can, that's understandable. They're white children, they chose white dolls. I can't imagine this to be a surprise to the researchers, given that it is a racially divided society where black people were negatively portrayed, if at all, in public art or advertising. The experiment was then conducted with black children of, and children of mixed heritage in a black school. They were given the same task and asked the same questions. When the task was concluded, it was also found that the black children had all chosen the white dolls. Shock, horror. This was a stark and shocking finding that even the black children could not choose the black doll that re represented trust and likability. In the choice they made, they had, through the symbolic act, inadvertently found themselves lacking in kindness, friendliness, and trustworthiness. As a result of this, the Clark study was seminal. So in 1976, uh, Davian Norburn, a colleague of mine uh, in West London, replicated this work and came across the same conclusions in 1976. I'd be curious as to what the findings would be now. What year was the first study done? 39. <clears throat> what does it say about little black children and their self-identity? And this is one of the necessary psychological consequences of colonization, and that is the disorder of empire. The high water mark of empire was the projection of the colonizer as an image to aspire to an ideal, yet the colonized people were mocked and gentle laughing up the sleeves of the natives who were internally so colonized that they did it so well, more British than the British. In fact, someone listening to me speaking would think, more British than the British. He speaks so well. <laughs> it's going on here in the room. <laughs> um, and to be, and, to, and, and the, the, the flip side of that is that sometimes people expect me, after all the rigours of my education and professional training, to speak pidgin English and to sound like shaggy or to sound like some other black reggae star. And I find that extraordinary among educated people. They say, but why do you speak so well? Why do you speak so well? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting thing. But because of a black face, I must also have a black voice. What is all that about? And it still goes on. So whiteness became what one needed to be, the skin lightening lotions, the adverts for fair skin marriage partners continued to be seen in the Asian magazines. Becoming internally colonized meant that the locals accepted the superiority of the whites and believed in their own inferiority. This is discussed in Fanon's Black Skin White Mask, and to some degree in Jean Jaunet's play The Blacks. Fanon, a black French psychiatrist and psychotherapist, said the, form, the formerly colonized who live in the land of the colonizer will always have a malady, a disorder of mind. So, and this is one of the things, of course, of psycho... Anybody here psychotherapist or student psychotherapist or counselors? Oh, there are a few. Right. Oh, good. Right. 
because the philosophers are, are prone to, to colonize us, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any power to colonise anyone. Aha. So having thrown off the belief in their inferiority, the formerly colonised presents a challenge to the former coloniser. This can have the effect of confusing and leaving them in a position of having to reappraise their own work, sometimes with its attendant resentment or anger. The mistaken belief in their innate superiority is difficult to let go as indeed their automatic right to be seen as in charge, to define work and the psychological state of mind. The process of colonization and empire building was more than a physical or geographical project, but also a mental one. White colonizers possessed psychological capital, which has served to define and the colonized people. Sometimes these echoes from the past can appear and can be evident in our present selves. The case of Gita. Gita is a British-born woman of Indian heritage, in therapy as part of her training as a counselor. She's employed by the health service as a senior administrator. Margaret, a white part-time colleague, has taken to leaving notes asking Gita to complete pieces of work for her. By the way, Gita is her superior. Leaving notes for her to complete pieces of work, which is against workplace practice, and for obvious reasons that people, if you can't complete your day's work, it says something about the tasks that need to be done and about work, work ratio and whatever, so the unions don't like people to shunt work onto somebody else, you know, if they couldn't complete it. But Gita dutifully completes the pieces of work for her colleague Margaret. Um, yet the first few times, and the first few occasions, Gita did, re did, did um, as she was requested. In therapy, she rages and was cross and said, these bloody white women continue to treat us as if we were their ayahs, which actually set in train a whole different part of what was explored in her therapy which hadn't been present before then, because Gita was a kind of British-born young woman who hadn't talked about her parents and her parents' colonialization and the experience of her parents and her early childhood experiences being raised in this country in the 70s. It actually opened a new door for her to explore in therapy. So with this, with this incident, was Gita being sensitive or are we seeing echoes of her experience of growing up in our prejudiced society being worked out on Margaret? Could it be that Margaret knew her place in relation to Asians and other foreigners and just cannot, and, and just cannot help herself bossing them around? Gita certainly feels that her treatment is redolent of the ways that house Indians were treated during the Raj, and she's certainly not having it. It's an interesting book written by um, uh, Guzda and Krishna. Um, uh, uh, Guzda is a, an American, a Canadian psychoanalyst in Montreal, talking about gender and race. Mm. Can't even remember her first name now. Anyway, I will put later on in the references. Maybe none of the above is the case, but a raw nerve is being touched here. Could it be that there is a collision of the person with an over overinflated sense of their worth and another possessing a devalued sense of themselves. Second case, Keith. Keith, 34, born of Caribbean parents, is a senior manager in local government. He is known to be a kind and easygoing person to his colleagues. He was appointed after graduating and has steadily worked his way up to seniority in, in the organisation. Along with two male white colleagues, they are conducting equal opportunity style interviews for middle manager posts. For a start, it shouldn't be three men, so they got it wrong there. They each have questions for the candidate and scores and answers that, uh, are individual before they share the perceptions and points. One of his colleagues has the chairperson's role and is sat in the middle like the three of us are here. Keith notices on the third occasion at conferring time that the chair turns to his white colleague to confer, 
leaving Keith absent and out of the discussion. <clears throat> Later, turning to Keith, said, we thought such and such a view. <laughs> Keith asked them whether or not his view was only deserving of a last mention, drawing their attention to what he'd seen going on. They said that they hadn't noticed. You know, it's a case of, I don't know what you're talking about. You, you mad? <laughs> mad and black? <laughs> Feeling affronted and slightly kind of discombobulated, Keith was wondering whether or not he should make a formal complaint. He did. He made a com not a formal complaint, he made an informal complaint. And they said, well, maybe you'd like to talk to um, Human Resources about it. Human Resources are so confused that they sent him to speak to a workplace counsellor, who I supervise. So all colonized people are in the gradual process of consciously or otherwise of undoing the psychological harm that was done to them or their ethnic group during the period of colonization. A small act, but Keith saying, what the fuck do you think is going on, is his <coughs> beginning process of decolonization. And you would have thought that if they were supposed to be doing equal opportunities, one, they should not all be men, and two, they should actually be careful of how they share information, because it's actually excluding one person, the only black person on the panel. To do otherwise is to accept the degraded version of themselves constructed by colonization, and this would be mental suicide. So my view is this small act of Keith's is an act to regain his sanity and his agency. And black people and Asian people are doing it every day to regain their sense of agency in this society. Small acts, but you let it go and you're digging your own grave. So when people say to me, oh, it happens all the time I, and I ignore it, I say to them, only ignore some. You have to fight, you have to stand up, and I guess there is a, there's a parallel here with gender issues and women who say, well, I don't want to keep complaining. I don't want to be known as being difficult. I said, keep on keeping on and keep on doing some of it if you can't do all of it. So, uh, living in the land of the colonizer, going back to Fanon, requires a great deal of resilience and the capacity to resist the subjugation. A problem of empire was that the double standard and, this was, and the skewed morality that it was fed, much of what the British claimed to stand for, fairness and even-handedness, often didn't apply unless it was in the favour of whites, and in many cases white men. Whilst the British males were encouraged to take Indian wives by, by the East Indian, East Indian Company, and the men, uh, men didn't, the Indian men didn't fraternize with white women. The Indian wives, sometimes called the Chutney Marys, raised their Anglo-Indian children and kept households that closely resemble lives in the home counties. The strict moral codes for the colonizers, colonizers were reinforced by the church, which warned against infidelity at the same time that British men kept concubines in India and slave masters in the Caribbean had uh, kept white, white wives at the same time as having uh, alternative black families with the slave women. These double standards and contradictions happened in full view of the church teachings against the background of forbidden marriages among the enslaved people. Slaves couldn't marry. You had to be free to be married, and if you were a slave, you couldn't be married. So slaves couldn't marry but the white slave masters and their staff could, have, could marry twice, could have formal marriages with white women and informal marriages, numbers of them with the black women. So it was a whole different thing that was actually flying in the face of the Christian teachings of the church. So colonization was considered a good thing by its very nature because it was a one-way process. The role of psychotherapy and counselling. Under the intense pressure of the transference, 
we enact old stereotypical roles, find ourselves compensating for past wrongs, sometimes wrongs that we didn't even personally commit, find ourselves quietly enraged, exercise denial, or find ourselves unable to engage with the material that is presented. The profession has found it difficult to think about how our colonial past has affected our present. And that's one of the things that we have to take from philosophers, is that philosophers can, can bear to think about colonization. Psychoanalysis, because of a kind of very personal interface, finds it difficult to engage with the whole issue of slavery and, what that, and how it comes into the consulting room in the profession. And also, there is a paradox here, because psychotherapy is about personalising people's experiences. And if you can't personalise the whole experience, what the fuck are you doing? Because the whole experience is one of slavery and colonisation. Mm -hmm. Those days of empire are collectively looked back on as a golden age by traditional British society whilst they might have been differently experienced by those who were colonised. And Malcolm X said, famously, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock when we came to America. Plymouth Rock landed on us. So Europeans who went to America landed on Plymouth Rock, but the rock landed on the blacks when they arrived. So how are we as therapists affected in the consulting room and how in what way might therapy be influenced on the, inten the intense pressure of transference and how racial stereotypes from the past get repeated in the present? And I'm going to, I'm going to have a quote here from, from uh, a writer called Brian Street who's writing about, about uh, football. Underlying even such crude, apparently simplistic activities as the grunts and calls of a football crowd to greet black players can be found a complex network of ideas and associations fossilized from the theory and ideology of a previous period. I discovered this in the grounds of West Ham football ground in 1973 when I went to a match at West Ham and heard the grunts when, uh, what was his name? One of the one of the early black footballers came on the pitch, and I thought, "Fuck this! I'm not going to another football match." <laughs> and I never went to another one. What's his name? The famous um, black player in uh, it will come to me in a minute. He went to America in the end as a coach. Nobody's West Ham supporter here. No. Best. Best was his name. Clyde Best. Hmm. Like the 19th century punch cartoons of Irishmen as subhuman species. Is anybody Irish here? No Irish? No Irish? Oh. There must be somebody with some Irish blood in this room. <laughs> A little bit, Miles. All right. Okay. <laughs> But, you know, they were, in the punch cartoons in, in Victorian era, and, and actually in the Edwardian era, Irish people characterised as subhuman, um, as kind of, kind of troll-type people. A psychological statement is made about the relationship of the Irish person in relation to the English punch reader, reading class, who no doubt had similar sentiments on others in the British Isles. The quote is a useful caution reminder of what might be laying dormant in our unconscious and how this can be easily activated transferentially. In his paper, 1964 paper, Myth, Transference and the Black Psychotherapist, American psychoanalyst posits the idea of pre-transference. It is the characterization of the therapist by the patient and the patient by the therapist before they meet and before a transference proper begins. The pre-transference is made up of fantasy, myth, and stereotypes to make a composite picture of the other person in the therapeutic space. Both therapist and patient brings the outside into the relational space of the therapy room. 
If we are open about this, the fantasies, myths and biases can be properly examined. The eloquently described fictional work between colonizer and colonized captures its complexity. Likewise, this is also to be examined in the therapeutic relationship. Unless the therapist is able to deal with their own feelings, the patient will not be able to make any progress with their highly conflicting emotions. In many cases, these feelings might have been with them since childhood and bricked up, sealed away for safety. Stories of empire and discrimination are passed from generation to generation. Whilst this information might now be devoid of strong emotions, they are nevertheless, nevertheless part of the patient's historical narrative. What sometimes gets played out in the consulting room is master-servant obsequiousness. The frightened white, ther white therapist, fearful of awaking the black beast of rage in the fuming of a silent black oration patient. Sometimes both therapist and patient can collude to remain in denial about black about the backstory. I was about to say black story. Yeah, about the backstory. Because not doing so would upset things. So keeping quiet and you know, Gita not talking about these memories that my parents have of being discriminated against with me is something that we have to forget. We can't talk about it anymore, it's in the past. And, and we do it sometimes because it's in the past and sometimes because it's, as we say in the Caribbean, it raises an ant's nest. You know, you're kicking an ant's nest and you're making trouble and you needn't do it. Behaviours in the family get transmitted. I'm very interested in how things get transmitted down the family. These behaviours can become as ubiquitous in the family as great-grandma's recipe for apple pie, and is also passed down the generations. Employing their skill to help right the wrongs that have been done in families is an urgent and legitimate task of the competent therapist or mental health worker. So in conclusion, disorders of empire I talk about the psychological effects, but slavery and colonization has always had an, an impact on all aspects of life. Um, skip, 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 skip. Many communities have, <laughs> have not shaken off the traumatic effects left by slavery and find themselves hanging on to the familiar psychological patterns unable to change. Some of these patterns fear success about unable to leave the unwanted coping strategies behind and are inward looking. Read et al. There's a, 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 a book called Post Traumatic Slavery Disorder, which is really interesting. It describes some of these things. So, self defeating attitudes, often characteristics of many of the obstacles facing professionals engaged in the work with clients who have not been able to dismantle their victim position in psychotherapy. Did you respond? Thank you. Um, so, as I say, I'll be brief. I'm, I'm, I've uh, very much enjoyed reading Lennox's paper and and then uh, hearing his presentation today. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to focus on was actually what I asked uh, my question about uh, before, which is um, your emphasis on on the family. Um, so I, I very much like your metaphor or image, whatever it is, of, uh, of uh, um, behaviours and attitudes being passed down uh, through families like great grandma's recipe for apple pie. Um, I think that's a great image. Um, notice that it's not grandma's recipe for apple pie, it's great grandma's. Uh, if you think of the, the kind of family tree, you can see there's, there's only quite a lot of descendants, um, different generations. Uh, these descendants will have mixed with very different people, married different people, gone and lived in different places. They'll have a lot of different cultural influences between them. Some of them won't even make apple pie anymore. Right? Some of them will make uh, apple pie that resembles great grandma's in some ways. Some will make it that resembles her apple pie in other ways. Some will make completely different kinds of apple pie. And some will be making precisely great grandma's apple pie. Uh, even if they don't even know exactly where the recipe originated. I think as a, as, a, as a metaphor for the kind of cultural transmission of attitudes and ideas 
uh, I th uh, down the family. I think that's a very rich image, and I think um, I think there's, there's more uh, that can be said about it than that. But I'm interested in this in this contrast between that idea and and Franz Fanon's idea that the primary um, uh, certainly that his primary interest was in cultural transmission through the shared media. The idea um, that in his time he said, you know, black children and white children in the French colonies at the time are raised on exactly the same stories, the same comics, the same films, right? And those stories and comics and films tend to have white heroes and they tend not to have many black characters. And if they do, those black characters are in very much subordinate roles or are uh, in, in many ways belittled. And it's, it's exposure to exactly the same images in both the black children and the white children, which uh, uh, he thinks uh, generates this kind of idea of inferiority and superiority uh, between the, the, um, the colonizer and the colonized. And I, I don't see these two ideas, uh, his emphasis on shared media and your emphasis on on families as in any way in conflict, right? I mean, they just seem to me complementary ideas and that both things can be happening. Um, so I think that that's a way in which the two uh, approaches are, are kind of mutually enriching. Um, but I think in your in your answer to my question, I think you said something uh, that, that sort of takes that thought much further, which was that you, you said that you want to emphasize the family because you think it's um, a kind of primary uh, resource for for resisting um, the negative influence of the wider culture. So so Ooh. so here the two the two kinds of cultural transmission are playing a kind of dialectical roles in, a, against one another. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I can I can I can illustrate that actually. So when as a child I was reading Dino and Biza. And all the other comics that, that I had, my father said, Perhaps you'd like to read this. And he'd hand me a book that would have black characters in it, and it would be a black hero. So that is the importance of the family. You know? The black family is there as a mediating between society and what is toxic in society at large, and what 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 you know, how it actually meets the child, the black child. And I think that is absolutely important and I will always emphasize the importance of the family because they they're not passive they're not passively receiving stuff they can actively repel stuff and it's also worked with my daughter when my daughter got to five years old she wanted a Barbie and she said I want a black Barbie so I had to go hunting into Hamleys to find her a black Barbie because she didn't want the other Barbie that all the others had because it didn't look like her. And that's the importance of the family. And that's the role the black family always has to play. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Asian family does it much better than black families. Much better. Because they have language and they have unique culture. They have stuff that is ours. Black people can actually very easily find that we don't have stuff that is ours. Because we're English speakers. And we are very assimilated people. Mm -hmm.